Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, I know tonight is the Brooklyn Democratic debate, but it seems that you may be learning a lot more about capitalism today <laughs> from our guest speaker. Uh, so uh, thank you for making it for this talk. Um, you might ask yourselves what does uh, neoliberalism or capitalism for that matter has to, have to do with applied linguistics. Uh, and the truth is that as the field is growing in interdisciplinarity and scope, uh, still this uh, question of political economy is not yet adequately addressed. I mean, the question of political economy in relation to language reforms. So thankfully, some people, like Professor Holbrook, uh, is working in this realm, and um, her influential and significant work has been crucial to our understanding of the politics of language and the critique of uh, neoliberal discourses. Among other important publications, she has a, a recent book from uh, Rutledge, Language and Neoliberalism, and also a co-authored book with um, David Block and John Gray, that's um, Neoliberalism and Applied Linguistics. And that said, I please join me in welcoming Professor Holbrook for today's distinguished lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya, for that nice introduction. First of all, I have to apologize, because you might have wanted, expected somebody from Dublin to have a nice Dublin accent. <laughs> <laughs> so already, my ability as an applied linguist is seriously in doubt. So I'm going to have to say things to really get over that. And I'm really, I, actually, I would have loved to have a, a Dublin accent, and I've been there for 30 years, so clearly I'm not very much of an applied linguist. I enjoy your accent. Huh? I enjoy your accent. Oh, well, that's very nice of you. That sets me at ease. Thanks very much indeed. Now, I'm going to start with the idea that in crises, things change a lot. And here, the sort of crises that we're dealing with is an extremely protracted crisis from 2008. But it started in America in 2008, and in Europe in 2011, 2012, <clears throat> and now, in 2016, they're talking about a, a continuation of the crisis in terms of the emerging markets. And so what David Harvey, who's a Marxist geographer, said about, the, about crises is interesting from the point of view of language and the point of view of ideology. But what is so striking about crises is the dramatic changes in ways of thought of understa and understanding of institutions, and dominant ideologies of the cultural customs and tastes that inform daily life. And so what he's talking about here is that crises change the way we think of things quite dramatically. And in language, this is very much the case. And what I want to look at is the relationship between social institutions, dominant ideology, and particular words that are used I, I'm going to argue since the crisis in the context of Ireland, and you have to remember, you may not know, that Ireland has been very severely affected by the crisis. We'll look at some of the detail of that, but certainly as much as you were in 2008, 2009, but it is continuing in Ireland. And what I would like to do is to bring to the fore what Del Himes, who was writing some time ago, actually 1996, he argued that what we needed was a socially constituted view of language that understood language in its full and rounded social context. And he talked about the social shaping of verbal means. So we need to see why it is that particular words come into usage at particular times. And you can't really think about any of these things without understanding the question of austerity. Now, austerity is in itself, before I look at what my focus of the talk today, we're surrounded by a number of words that have become very, very common and in different languages with different emphases that are crucial to this period of crisis. And Mark Blythe, who has written a book on austerity, calls it a very dangerous idea. And if you look at austerity, which was the way that many of governments started to deal 
with the question of the banking collapse and so on, they use this word austerity right across the Western world, really. And austerity was sometimes referred to as fiscal consolidation, right? But austerity was a dangerous word because it conjures up something else than economics. Austerity is a very complex leveled word, actually. It's a lot of layers to it. It's the idea of prudence, of wisdom, of not spending too much, all these kind of slightly emotional or ethical concepts to it. And yet it is a policy that is pursued by many governments, in our case in Ireland, permanently now, since 2008, austerity. And there's been quite a lot written about this word austerity, and because it's the setting in which I'm going to look at particular words um, in the crisis in Ireland, it rests on not just this moral dimension, but the idea that somehow national economies are just like household budgets. That, you know, if you're good and you don't go out and spend too much in the supermarket, that's a good thing to do. In fact, if you cut back and don't go to the supermarket that week, that's even better. Right? Now, economies, because of the scale and because of the effect of economic policies, are not actually comparable to a household. Because our households are run on, you know, particular... Sources of income come in. There's a very good article written by a woman called Sheila Dow who talks about this and says that it's impossible to compare microeconomic <coughs> unit and a microeconomic unit with a macroeconomic system. And yet, this is the assumption behind the word austerity. So here is an example how one word austerity is laden with lots of dimensions of significance. And our Irish uh, Labour minister at the time follows this very much along the lines of austerity. And in fact, yeah, I could have taken this particular quote that he said in 2013, but this is very commonly repeated amongst Irish politicians, that austerity is not a choice, it's learning to live within your means. So making the exact assumption that austerity for a government spending and for a family is the same. And, of course, people relate to that. And in Ireland, it's very interesting from a language point of view because there are a whole lot of current expressions that back up this idea of austerity. And they're very interesting. From anybody who's interested in language, you may not recognise some of these very idiomatic expressions. Perhaps, for example, the last one, we lost the run of ourselves. How many of you recognise that idiomatic expression? Does anybody have any idea what it might mean? <coughs> yeah, it's an Irish-English expression, right? It's used in the Irish-English, so it's a, a variety of English, right? We've lost, the, we've lost the run of ourselves. Now, this was the idea that was put across to justify austerity, that all of us spent way too much during the boom, and here we should now wake up, be much more sensible, and spend much less, right? So we lost the run of ourselves. These were the three tropes that people have argued, actually um, Nagel and Coulter in 2015 in their book, have argued that there were three tropes, in other words, three frames that conditioned the way that austerity was introduced into Ireland. The last one, we lost our run. We were too spendthrift uh, in the period previously, so we need to cut back. We're all in this together, right? And we are where we are. Now, we are where we are is an amazing expression. And apparently, researchers have looked at this, and can you believe it was said no less than 270 times in the Irish Parliament by 80 different politicians. We are where we are. Now, this is a very interesting expression because it completely forecloses any discussion about why we are where we are if you see what I mean, right? It also tells you something about the inanity of politicians, I have to say, right? We are where we are. What does this tell anybody except rubbish, really, right? But this is interesting uh, because it comes, brings together sort of ordinary, everyday expressions which are highly ideological. They're not just simply things reeled off. They have ideology behind them. And here, the key word in all of this is the we. 
Because you have to remember again, the austerity program was introduced because the Irish banks went bust. They went very seriously bust. It's actually described as the worst banking history in history. Tiny little Ireland had the worst banking crisis in history. Right? So it was pretty serious. And the government bailed out the banks. So actually, hold on a minute, it's not we. It's the banks are where they are, not we are where we are. Right? So this use of the pronoun is what Richard Sennett calls a very dangerous pronoun. It's fine to use we when you actually mean we, but often it is used again ideologically to shift responsibility. And suddenly you're engaged in something that has nothing to do with you. I have nothing to do with Anglo-Irish bank lending to property speculators or anything else, right? I wasn't we. It was them, actually. So it's an interesting example. So I'm setting you in the frame here of thinking about everyday language that is conducive to particular ideologies, but I want to concentrate particularly on a particular word. No, before I do that, before I do that, the idea of shifting from one collectivity to another is shifting the area of responsibility, what Jamie Peck calls a strategy of displacement. And he argues in the American context, which you may be familiar with, he argues that uh, instead of it being bl the problem of the crisis being blamed on the people who are responsible for the crisis, it is shifted to other people. And he talks about two strategies here. A strategy of displacement, which is to shift it to somewhere else. And through this is a redistribution of wealth and a re-narration of the situation. And he says that, the similar to Ireland actually, that the banks, although they were responsible, it was states who picked up the tab for this. And so there was again a displacement from the people responsible to somebody else, the taxpayer. And from our point of view, the important thing is the word re-narration, because he said that things were described in a different way. So you see here the role of language in redescribing things as well, in order, he argues, to redistribute the wealth. And so he also talks, and it's useful for us, for our point of view, in that context, he talks about not just this happening, but he talks what he calls the pushers of austerity. He says that people push the austerity agenda. And a second aspect of this is that you could say that it seems very illogical to push this austerity agenda because it's not working. In fact, economies are standing still. There isn't the recovery that people expected. So why is it still going on? Is it an irrational thing to do? And alongside Jeremy Peck's uh, analysis, I think it's important to understand that there are social actors behind this. I've mentioned the banks, but there are governments who implement this. So these are players. They are what he calls the pushers of austerity. And in the linguistic context, this is important because often we don't talk enough about social agency in language. Because we all use language, we tend to think it's spontaneous and so on. But I think you have to distinguish between official institutional language, language that becomes popular in the media, language that becomes overused, which very much, I'm going to argue in this paper, you can trace the social agency of that language. Okay, so that's sort of setting the scene. And another book that is useful for you here, if you're interested in the Irish background to austerity, is by Alan and O'Boyle, called Austerity Ireland. And it gives you a lot of the detail of the banking crisis and so on. And the point is made by those two authors that one of the things that happens in austerity is a narrowing down of political possibilities, that austerity becomes the only possibility to get out of the banking crisis. Okay, that's a little bit of background to you. And I want to look at a particular word. I'm going to look at entrepreneur. As you can see, nation of entrepreneurs. And this is argued, the word entrepreneur, which I notice probably because somebody is running for the Republican Party. This word is used rather a lot, too. 
as we will see, there are parallels. Indeed, these days there seem to be parallels across very many different countries. But anyway, I'm, the, the prism through which I'm going to look at this language, you may have heard of Raymond Williams. Keywords was a book by Raymond Williams. Raymond Williams was a British cultural theorist at the time of the Second World War. And he noticed when he came back from the army, joined the army, and was involved in the Second World War, he noticed that words changed very much in the post-war period. And the words that he picked were very often political words, directly political words. So he analyzed things like class, doctrinaire, labor, all of these words that at a time of social unrest, which was Second World War, post-Britain Second World War, and indeed in Europe, there was quite a lot of social unrest as well. Popular, underprivileged, reactionary status, Western welfare. They were directly political words, which he argued were changing their meaning at the end of the Second World War. And he saw that these words were like clusters of ideology. They seemed to contain an ideological position. So if you use the word labor, you were, do, you were also telling people something about where you stood vis-a-vis -vis that. Right? So he saw them as sort of uh, <coughs> ideologically intensely significant. And he said that they indicate certain forms of thought and that they were changing. One of the, which uh, I don't actually have there, one of the words that, for example, that he had was the word peasant, which was very widely used prior to the Second World War. But suddenly, during the Second World War, it was no longer used. So, He's very interested in the history of words, if you like, and it's a very interesting, it's a nice book to look at, because it's slightly dated now when you see it, because you class and underprivileged, these words underprivileged, not used today in the same way. But he was picking on words that were sensitive at that time. So Raymond Williams' keywords is one aspect that I'm going to look at, words like entrepreneur through. And the other is Voloshinov, who wrote in the 1920s a book called Marxism and the Philosophy of Language, where he was examining how much you could read ideology into language, how much ideology and language were linked. And of course, you think, what's the connection? But when you think about it, how else can you express ideology except in language? And so part of my argument here is that we need to look at what we mean by ideology, because the words that we use are often closely bound up with the concept of ideology. And for Lotfeld Voloshinov, what he said is the word is the ideological phenomenon par excellence, he said. OK, so those are the two sort of theoretical poles that I will be looking at this word, entrepreneur. Now, and as I do this, I'd be really interested that you think yourselves what you think in the American context entrepreneur means. It probably means slightly different things in different contexts. But in Ireland, it has been pushed hugely since the crash. Suddenly, this word entrepreneur is everywhere, everywhere. And um, a rather interesting cultural critic called Jean Kerrigan has said that we're all a nation of entrepreneurs now in Ireland. Everybody is an entrepreneur, right? Which is where I got the title of the uh, talk from. And he is saying that suddenly, he's not quite a rather like Williams, he noticed the same thing as Raymond Williams, sometime during the Celtic Tiger era, which was the period before the crisis, being in business became old-fashioned. And there arose the concept of the entrepreneur, people with risk running in their veins, with minds hewn from solid blocks of ambition. You became an entrepreneur by declaring yourself to be one. So suddenly the word, like what we saw with Williams, words began to change. The value of the word entrepreneur became something different to what it was before. And what I'm going to look at is a few examples now in official discourse where entrepreneur is used. And you will see just how widely it is used. And you might think if it's used as widely in the American context. First of all, my first example, and of course you have to remember the linguistic context of Ireland, that it's a bilingual country, officially, there are two languages, English and Irish, and I'm not meaning Irish-English, I mean Irish, the language, 
Um, and so all our, all our official documents are also in Irish and English. And the, what would this be the equivalent of in the States? This would be the White House, I suppose, or something. You know, the, what do you call the Department of the President? Is there a Department of the President? The executive branch, would that be? The, actually a Department of Government. Yes, okay. So this would be, um, in here, this is the Department of the Taoiseach. The Taoiseach is the Irish word for Prime Minister. Okay? And since recent times, we've had a lot of strategic plans from the Department of the Taoiseach. So the Taoiseach is the person who is the Prime Minister at the moment. Does anybody know who that is in Ireland? Why not have a little bit of test question here? Anybody know? <laughs> right, it's a small little country, and why would you? Right, absolutely. Ender Kenny is his name, right? And actually, at the moment, it's not quite clear who is, because we've just had an election, and nobody's quite clear who's in government, which kind of makes people think, do we need a government? We've had it now for about six weeks. <laughs> Everything seems to be going fine. But anyway, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, so, Department of the T-shirt, right, is now regularly since the crash bringing out strategic plans now we've had a tendency towards plans since the 70s but in days of crisis plans are very important because people say god you know which way are we going we've got to get it all sorted out and what you will find in these documents is that enterprise pops up all the time so enterprise now is a central economic plan so a sustainable, for example, there are taken many examples, but this one, a sustainable economy through supportive enterprise environment, increased levels of entrepreneurship, continued improvement in public finances, and further reductions in unemployment. So enterprise becomes an economic policy now. This is quite new. In the past, you would talk about investment, or you would talk about private investment. You wouldn't talk about an attitude or a, an approach to business being central to the economy. So this is new. Secondly, we've actually changed the department that deals with jobs. It's now, it, it used to be, at one stage, it was the Department of Commerce. I was checking, actually, in, in America whether you've had these changes. And in America, it's known as, what is it known as? The Department of Commerce. I think, isn't it still? Chamber. Not the Chamber of Commerce so much as, I'm talking here about the Department of Government. The Secretary of Labor? No, no, no it's, it's not, jobs, because no. there's jobs, yeah, that's right. This is more, this was the previously the industry element. But I think the word commerce is still, am I correct or not? Maybe not. When I checked it online, I think commerce is, it's quite an old fashioned word actually, I was quite surprised that it, it has, hasn't changed. No, 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 no criticism, of course. But I, I was quite surprised that commerce was still used because it sounds kind of you know, quaint, doesn't it? But um, in the Irish context, it used to be known, in, up until the 1980s, it was the Department of Industry, Commerce and Energy. Then it was... Ah, oh, that's an interesting... Ah, oh, welcome to the US. No, no. Okay. Um, so it was known as the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment... And now it's got enterprise in its title, right? So enterprise has become the official title and indeed enterprise is used a lot in their documents, right? So we've got enterprise at the level of the prime minister, we've got enterprise at the level of economic policy and we also have local enterprise office now, offices now. This is all new, by the way, since the crisis. So we have a local enterprise office, um, which is given quite a large sum of money. It's given 40 million euro, which is a lot, to set up these enterprise offices. And it is sort of where the state in the past was not involved so much in setting up enterprise. It now puts, you might even call it enterprise welfare, actually, because it is given to businesses from the government to do this. We also have, and I don't know whether you have this in the state, we now have a Young Entrepreneur of the Year, which is run by an accountant company called Ernst & Young. And this is a big thing in colleges, actually. 
people who people compete for it, the Young Entrepreneur of the Year, and <coughs> it's uh, quite a desire. People are very keen to get the money because then you get some funding from venture capitalists and so on. This is all quite new. The Young Entrepreneur started in the 90s, I suppose, perhaps 2000, I think it was 1999 was the first one. So again, this is a new concept. It's highly competitive, there's only one. The best entrepreneur has to be one. And so it's a sort of competitive, uh, quite individualistic thing, I think, in some ways. Now, you've also got it in universities. Now, my university, Dublin City University, is now called the University <coughs> of Enterprise. Now, I actually teach sociolinguistics. And it's kind of difficult for me to wrap my head around the idea that I'm teaching enterprise. I mean, I could be. I, if you took enterprise to mean innovation, imagination, and so on, I suppose you could take it as that. But it's an odd word for a university, I think. This is the Dublin City University is now called the University of Enterprise. Sorry, it's still called Dublin City University, but it has underneath it, welcome to the University of Enterprise. So we've got something going on here in official discourse that is quite... Um, systematic, I think, across different fields. There is another area, and again I'd be interested in the university, sorry, the enterprise thing in the university is very much about startups. So now you can get credits for setting up your own startup in a university. So if you're a student and you set up a startup and you win a prize for that, you can get a certain amount of credits for doing that. So it's very much integrated now into the degree courses itself, the setting up of enterprise. So you start, so this would be a typical picture on a, a university website where you have the president, the <coughs> minister of enterprise who's there, and this particular person who won the thing, and so on. So it's all about competition, whether it's a young entrepreneur or even in the university getting that. The other uh, area that it has now gone down to is to primary school teaching. Now, in, in Ireland, the Jesuits used to have an expression, give me the child at seven and I will give you the man. What was meant by that, this is often quoted these days when people are perhaps thinking about these things, um, that, in other words, the earlier you get somebody, the more committed they are going to be to a particular uh, idea. And now we have entrepreneurship taught at primary school level. Again, I, I would be very interested in the discussion to hear whether you have the same thing in the States. So you have a junior entrepreneur system, uh, you have a program, you have various CEOs, in this case it is the man who introduced the Dragon's Den, which is a TV entrepreneurial uh, thing. I think it, it's called The Apprentice here, is it? Has it been called The Apprentice or something here? That is the looking for, what's it called here? Yeah, it sounds like Shark Day. Shark Day, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, quite aggressive, actually, much more aggressive than I go right. Um, okay, so uh, this is from the dragons. Then um, this man is there with the young kids, and they're teaching them entrepreneurship. So my point is, um, and I could have lots of examples of this, is that entrepreneurship has stretched semantically right across fields where it never would have been before. And one would never have imagined at primary school that you would have had that. There is another area. Finally, that has become, since the crisis, <coughs> very keen on social on entrepreneurship, is social entrepreneurship, which is bringing the business model to welfare and to the provision of social services. And this is becoming quite a big thing in the government policy at the moment, because part of the condition is that it doesn't look for government funding, but it does crowdfunding, it does its own funding, etc., which, as we will see, fits into a particular pattern that is suitable for austerity, that is particularly timely if governments are cutting back on various spending programs. And in, I did an in, as one of the papers that I did, I did an interview with social entrepreneurs, and two of one of the people mentioned Hillary Clinton as a social entrepreneur, which I find interesting. She said, "I'm not Hillary Clinton, but I agree with her idea on social." And the other quote was about uh, Nike. Just do it. It's the idea of 
not regarding a problem as a bind, but seeing it as an opportunity, getting stuck in and providing whatever service is required in the community. Um, the other, the third reference was to Bono. Bono would be very, the U2 singer, right, would be very involved in this kind of concept of social entrepreneurship. Now, all my different examples show how this word has stretched hugely in the last decade or so. And what I'm going to ask, and you can check out some of the other examples that I have of the appearance of this word, what I'm going to really ask is why is it so uniform? It's strangely uniform. Uh, in a context where other linguists are talking about super diversity, with different variations, all sorts of different accents, all sorts of different types of language, here we have a, something else going on, which is a uniformity of language, a uniformity of the use of a word. Who is promoting it? Who's promoting this ideological keyword? And in what context are they being promoted? Now, first of all, it is important to say that Ireland is not alone in the use of this word. Many, and as the crisis has hit, the role of European institutions materially, because they bail out the banks, but also in terms of culture, is becoming much more predominant in, a, in the local European countries' context. So many policies first arise in Europe, and then they are transferred down to Ireland. And the European Commission is an important wing of the European Union in this. And they have a series of studies on entrepreneurship in higher education, where does, uh, what's happening to that? They have a survey that says how many people are involved in entrepreneurship, very carefully researched. And also in the Irish context, they carry out these research, this research too. So one of the places that it appears to originate from is the European Union, the European Commission's reports and strategy documents that are produced. Very often, the image of entrepreneurship across both European contexts and local contexts are very similar. The images prom promoted are often these highly energetic people. Um, so you see people running around all over the place, stretching for the sky and so on. This one, as it happens, is the Irish version of the survey of entrepreneurship in higher education. And this one is the European version of higher education, entrepreneurship in higher education. Now, higher education is many things, and may maybe physical exercise is part of it and so on, but it is kind of, it's very different to the classic university or higher education that people are sitting with books and thinking about. This is stretching around. It's a completely different dynamic concept. And I notice in the American apprentice thing that uh, Donald Trump did, the same image occurs of somebody dashing across. So for some reason, entrepreneurship has stretched into all sorts of energetic fields and become sort of dynamic, just dynamic. doesn't matter what you're doing, just be dynamic. And in a study that I have seen, I can actually see the copy and pasting of this word and the transposing of centered chunks of text from the European context to the local context. And this is uh, where social agency comes in. This is very much, you could, partly the role of reports, partly the role of surveys, but you could actually trace down the textual repetition through the various institution, from institutions from the European Commission to, in our case, the Higher Education Authority, to a university, and then to these different things. So it's not as if it's come from nowhere. It has an official source as well. And I termed this the standardizing of keywords. Now, often standardizing is used in the context of dictionaries. But here, you have a far more efficient way of people reproducing the same word through institutions and through reports <coughs> And things like the OECD and the EU and the European Commission produce these reports, which very quickly become documents, and the same words are used and very often in English, it has to be said, even if the country's language is not English, 
and you see it reproduced in this way. So social agency plays a key role in this. Now, when you talk about social agency, in language, for various reasons, as I alluded to before, agency is not often thought of so much because of the nature of language and the slipperiness of it and the individuality of it and so on. You often don't think of it, but it has been talked about quite a lot in cultural theory. And often it's referred to as social voice. In other words, the social dimension of who is speaking, who is the identity of this person. And Bakhtin, who was a Russian uh, cultural theorist, again sometime back in the 1920s and 30s, talked about slogan words being used in this sense, that they were collective words that caught on and that had a particular role and power at a particular point in time. And another uh, quote from uh, Voloshinov talked about it being a social purview. In other words, it came from a particular group of people and you could identify who it was. Now, in Ireland, how much time have I got? I'll come back to it. In Ireland, it's very interesting where entrepreneur is used. Entrepreneur, by the way, actually was first used for an Irishman. Um, his name is Cantignon, and he was, there was a big connection between Ireland and France. And at the time of the French Revolution, he was an Irish banker in France. And many of these ideas about entrepreneurship developed coming up to the French Revolution. And so it was actually coined with its meaning of somebody who sets up a business and who is imaginative in finance, first of all by an Irish person. And his name is Cantignon because he was half French and half Irish. And we still, in our Irish times, have a column called Cantignon, which is about business and so on. So it sort of runs a particular thread in Ireland. But also, there are various reasons in Ireland where entrepreneurship has caught on and has a certain connection. First of all, because Ireland has emigration, a, ser a serious er emigration has always had it through its history as some of you might be witness to yourselves sitting here, probably. Is there anybody from Irish extraction here? Right, okay. So this, you know, it, the emigration in Ireland has been a huge thing to the United States, but to lots of other places. And with that has often come the idea of rags to riches. In other words, you leave very poor, but you make good somewhere else. And in days gone by in Ireland, Kennedy was the sort of prime example of an Irishman made good in America from a very poor background. So it has that ring in the Irish context as well. These days, there are entrepreneurs on many, many public buildings. So this is Dennis O'Brien, who is probably in Forbes 200 most wealthiest people in the world. Dennis O'Brien is his name. Um, he has a huge uh, mobile phone empire in the Caribbean called Digicel. Um, he ha is, he's made a lot of money, let's put it like that. And he also is important in this context because he, ha he controls something like 50% of the Irish print media in Ireland, which is a significant amount. So what he says tends to go. And not only that, on, in many cases, and you, I'm sure you have a lot of that here, Philanthropists will give their name to libraries or to private buildings, and O'Brien libraries are around too, uh, as a result of that too. So that's a particular resonance in Ireland for that. There's also the resonance of the knowledge economy. The Bill Gateses of this world, etc. The idea that the knowledge economy has opened up the possibility of entrepreneurship. So there's all these contexts in which entrepreneurship has become um, something that is kind of trendy, very modern. Uh, one of the writers about the Californian ideology of uh, the new economy and talks about it being hip and rich, an entrepreneur being hip and rich. So there's, there's all sorts of uh, connotations to the word entrepreneur that makes it highly symbolic and attractive to use in the context that we're talking about here. 
However, there's also another side of entrepreneurship, which is extreme individualism. Entrepreneurship and pushing entrepreneurship in um, policy documents and so on is a view of society that it is individuals who make and run economies. That there are, that it isn't primary structures or collective agencies, it's individuals that run economies, both at the top of the economy and at the bottom of economy. So there was a book written by Barbara Ehrenreich called Bait and Switch, which followed the 2001.com crisis here in the States and some other places. And she wrote after that that one of the fallouts of the crisis was that people believed that they were responsible for having lost their job. And she wrote about executives who went and tried to retrain and believed that really it was really up to them to go and get another job. It wasn't a problem of the company that had collapsed. And she says that this idea of entrepreneur was very, very important in that kind of understanding of your role in, in having a job or not having a job. And she said, you must recognize that you alone are the source of all the conditions and situations in your life. You must recognize that whatever your world looks like right now, you alone have caused it to look that way. So if you like, it's a kind of extreme individualism. Mirovsky, Philip Mirovsky, who has written about entrepreneurship since the crisis and neoliberal ideology, says it in a more developed way, in a sense. He talks about the fragmentation of the neoliberal self. It's that you're not just an employee or a student, but you're simultaneously a product to be sold, a walking advertisement, a manager of her resume, a biographer of her rationales, and an entrepreneur of her possibilities. So you are responsible for every aspect of your life. Now, in some ways that's quite uh, empowering, it seems like. But it's also quite a responsibility and can be quite problematic, if, especially if these things don't come true. But you can see that entrepreneur, in this sense, is used as a sort of new form of individualism that makes individuals, not societies, responsible for whatever situation occurs. I will touch on this because I don't want to go into too much theory here, um, but Foucault also talked about entrepreneur. Now, some of you will have heard of Michel Foucault, who spent a lot of time writing at the end of his life about neoliberalism. And one thing he discovered about the writings on neoliberalism was that entrepreneur became a key word in understanding how neoliberalism works. That it makes us responsible for ourselves. It's not so much government, it's individuals. And he said that the new person in this society is a self-standing entrepreneur. It's somebody who looks after themselves, deals with themselves, makes sure that they has enough money, and he argued that this was a new form of governmentality, what he called <coughs> governmentality. In other words, it wasn't the government. It was me as an individual, a combination of government and mentality. It was me that, as an individual, made sure that I could fit into society. So it was a different way of seeing how things work. work, work. Right. Now, the coming back to what we said earlier, there is a question of social agency. If I'm responsible for everything in society, where does that leave society? It, there, this raises a difficulty about social agency. Is it the case, and we can perhaps discuss this more, that individuals are solely responsible for what happens to their lives? Or are there other interactions in society that are important to be aware of? Now, in the Irish context, one way of interrogating the validity of the word entrepreneur is to see if it's working. To see, all this, uh, to see if all these policies on entrepreneurship are actually working. And of course, the reality for the vast majority of graduates who leave university in Ireland is quite sadly not becoming an entrepreneur. It's leaving the shores of Ireland and going somewhere else. And we have had a huge exodus of people from Ireland. Now, you could say they're going to go and be entrepreneurs somewhere else. 
not often. They end up doing quite manual tasks, usually under, they're overqualified for the jobs if they manage to get a job. Many Irish people will be unemployed. Graduate unemployment is very high in Ireland. So from the point of view of entrepreneurship creating jobs, it's not working that much. Um, if you look at the reality of the image of entrepreneurship, again, the idea that everybody should be trying, the aim of everybody should be to create their own business is a bit unrealistic if you look at society. Various studies have been done about how many people are self-employed. Now, it is growing in some places. In, in Britain, for example, it's growing quite considerably. But in overall, on average, in Europe, there's only 8% of people who are self-employed. Now, some of those people would be self-employed because they're on casual contracts as well. So some of them wouldn't be exactly running their own business. In Ireland, it now stands at around 8%. But also, many of those people are doing it from necessity. In other words, they're trying to get, go and sell a few sandwiches somewhere or sell cups of coffee. And, they are, and very often, when they are successful, they very quickly get taken over by big companies. So it's often a transition phase rather than a real one. Plus, in Ireland, the biggest sector of employment is the public sector. Now, like many post-colonial countries, the role of the state has been greater than in other countries very often. And so there has been traditionally, even though there's been quite a lot of cutbacks in the public sector. So the point being is that the individualism of entrepreneurship in practice doesn't really work out for many people. So you'd be talking far more likely about being in a, a mass workplace situation and probably not working for yourself and in very often, many cases, being unemployed as well. <coughs> Secondly, it is the big companies that are dominating increasingly. So it is the Googles and the Apples and the... It isn't... And while there is room for... The, originally, they might have been set up by entrepreneurs, the possibility of on, entrepreneurship in those companies is more determined by the structure of those companies themselves. But we can discuss that. But in any event, in Ireland, the... Um, Multinationals account for 10% of the population, but these are big companies, and so the idea of a startup company would, uh, you, doesn't really fit into to that picture either. So I suppose to sort of bring this to a close, what I have tried to do is to look at how one particular word has stretched its meaning with all sorts of ideological implications. And one way of questioning that is by seeing, does it match up with reality? Look at social reality and see, does the promise of entrepreneurship match up with that? So, anyone can be an entrepreneur. Well, no, not anybody can be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship creates jobs, not necessarily. So, one way of interrogating an ideological idea is to see whether it works. The other thing is that in a situation where you have opposition to what is going on with austerity, and recently in Ireland there has been big movements against austerity, this language of entrepreneurship just sounds hollow and <coughs> doesn't fit with the reality of what people are experiencing. This is a picture. There have been the, most big, the biggest mobilizations and demonstrations in Ireland that have been seen ever over a very strange thing, which was the water charge. It was an attempt to introduce payment for water. Now, again, you might not know this, or you may know this, that the most common thing in Ireland is rain. So the idea of having to pay for water kind of re really was... Uh, uh, people couldn't believe it, really. They really could not believe it. Now, it sounds, it's funny how these things really tip a balance sometimes. They accepted all sorts of austerity in terms of their salaries, in terms of other taxes, and so on. But when it came to taxing water, it was a tipping point. And you never know what these tipping points are. Yeah. Can you clarify a little bit um, the tax on water in the sense that they're taxing like bottled water or they're taxing water, oh. you know, publicly used water? No. Or good, good, absolutely good point. No, up until now, water has been taxed as part of the general taxation system. So a certain amount of money out of your tax, of which we're quite highly taxed in Ireland, actually. 
uh, comes out of your taxation system. But what they wanted to do was to meter it and introduce a new tax. And again, at every turn, this has been a huge crisis for them. I mean, at every turn they've done it wrong because they said it was about restricting the amount of water you use, but the meters are not in your house. They're outside. You have to get a screwdriver to undo it. So, I mean, it's, it's very difficult, actually, to see what you consume. So everybody, right from the beginning, the combination of the rain and the way it was introduced, and then they spent a lot on PR for it, and people thought, why are you spending it on that and not mending the pipes? And so, so it got worse and worse and worse. And the funny thing was that people had put up with austerity for five or six years, but this was just too much. And suddenly there was a new election and so on and so forth. So it, it was an extra tax on top of other ones. And I have to say that, for example, a public servant like myself in, in university and so on, we, were all, we had our salaries reduced by 30%, reduced by 30% now. In other places, it's been more than that. In Spain and Greece, it's been more than that. But not only that, you were paying a number of levies. So, for example, you were paying a 10% pension levy. But it didn't change your pension. It was called a bit, you know, so there was all this, and then so water being introduced on top of this just seemed like too much. So the point that I'm saying here is that these things don't just, you could, one thing is to critique them and say that they are an ideological expression, and you can show that by matching them with reality about how much they actually reflect and describe accurately reality. But the other thing is the broader social context in which these words are absorbed. And while at some point entrepreneur might have seemed credible at some level, when it isn't delivering and when other alternatives come into view, suddenly it doesn't seem as credible or it seems empty and it, if you like, seems more ideological than before. So this is what you could call common sense becoming good sense. We were talking about this earlier. Common sense entrepreneur seems a commonsensical thing to do. But suddenly, if things change, and the conditions change, and who says it becomes apparent, it seems as though it isn't any longer common sense, and maybe a bit more good sense is required. This is the term used by Gramsci. Now, you've been very patient to listen to me, so I'm just going to quickly conclude what I've said here. The first point that I really wanted to make is that entrepreneur is a key word in an ideological sense that it performs, at various degrees, a strategy of displacement away from social problems to individualism. So it's a, what Jamie Peck would call a strategy of displacement. The channels of transmission of such words of entrepreneurship, they haven't just landed out of nowhere. They have come from think tanks, from the European Commission, through agencies such as local ministries and so on are repeated in reports and become get, get their own dynamic and own social life. And that is, behind that is social agency in the standardizing of those keywords. And that the analysis of these keywords, and it would be interesting in your context at a particular time to see what keywords operate in this way, either in higher education or in society or in the election campaign, very good time to be looking at those things, uh, to see what keywords represent this kind of intense ideological <coughs> dimension. And once you begin analyzing that, you can find either they are upheld and seem impervious to criticism, or sometimes, at particular points in time, they become open to criticism and don't seem like common sense anymore. And from that point of view, language is a highly political and ideological thing. So thank you very much for listening to me. And lots of time. To